All right. So how is it going? So let's um, let's isolate the um, the parts. Um, so the, let's focus on how how can this be blocked. So the question was um, that just to repeat for the stream, uh, we have a task to conduct a, a kind of a behavior of study on the usage of mobile phones, where we want to log when the users pick their phones and check on the screen their notifications. Um, and we also want to di differentiate between people just checking the screen without logging in and with people checking their screen and going in using the uh, one of the authentication mechanisms. So how can this be done? And I presume you've checked it for Android? And <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, it wasn't as clear as some of the intents were um, for example, like kernel only, root only. Yeah. But it seems like you can use action use repressing as intent to yeah. see if the key card is gone with the read from state merge. Yeah. So user present. Yeah, action use repressing. Action user present, and that one gives us what? Uh, it uh, is. It's. Um, from when the key card is gone. Yeah. So like when the phone is unlocked. So we need a new version added in Android A24 or A24. It is action user unlocked. That okay. is ready when the user has unlocked. Yeah. So unlock is present from AP24. Yeah. But can you declare it in your manifest? What I read it was kind of like you don't have access to it. You, okay, we will cover that. So we will cover the manifest in a moment. Yeah. Uh, I don't know with the 24 API revision, but. The, that um, one is from. Read. Yeah. Up in yeah. Okay, and that one is uh, more. And go away to the if the screen is on or not. Yeah. Only really for that. Yeah. With uh, action, uh, with the screen on. are broadcasted onto the system and you can subscribe your broadcast receiver to receive notifications when, when those events happen, right? So the underlying mechanism is something called uh, broadcasts. Uh, so why Android has broadcasts? So what? that every single notification doesn't listen to the file Yeah, sort of. I mean, the, you have to register a callback. So on a particular event, you are notified that something happened. But what is the main kind of reason for having broadcast in the um, in Android? I don't know, letting everybody know. Yeah, good. So, um, yeah, like broadcasting certain stage, system events. Stage yeah. series. Um, so what happens when I have my um, music player going and there is a phone call coming? What happens then? It's break. The music is break. So the phone call, I will be able to hear a phone call. Yeah. So the music player is notified that there is a high priority app that requires access to the microphone and speaker. And then the music player pauses. Then the phone call app takes over uses it for itself, 
and then when it's done, it tells the music player, well, I'm done, you can keep playing, right? Uh, so it also does it through broadcasts and through the priorities to kind of uh, have, uh, so like system events, um, or you have, um, yeah, yeah, how do you call it? Um, Yeah, I don't remember the correct term, but it, it, it is about playing nicely with other apps, right? So the, everybody is developing apps, and everybody wants the user to have the best experience. So the, there is kind of a de facto uh, common understanding that certain system events will have certain effect, right? Uh, so for example, what happens if the battery go, goes too low, the system broadcasts to everybody, okay, the battery is getting really low, we may be needing to shut down soon, right? And then all the apps can back up they set themselves and do some something, right? Uh, if the RAM is getting really low, the system says to everybody, look, uh, we're running out of RAM. If you can release some resources, release the resources. Otherwise, the operating system will start killing some unused uh, activities or whatever, right? So you have some system events which are being broadcasted. Um, and those broadcasts also happen to use some of those. So like screen being on and off, and uh, user being present, or user unlocking the phone, right? <clears throat> so we can register uh, a particular broadcast receiver and kind of listen to that. Um, <clears throat> where can we do that? Can we do that in the manifest file? Well, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. So those in particular are so-called um, local broadcasts, which means you have to have an app running, right? So if we have a system, if we have, th this is the, you know, the operating system running all the activities, um, and we have uh, the storage. So let's say we have storage here. Um, and the runtime, runtime here. Uh, some events happen here and some notifications happen. So for example, if the user received an SMS, then there is a broadcast saying, okay, there is a new SMS, and whatever apps have registered uh, in the manifest file that are interested in new SMS being received, they will be woken up, which means they will actually be loaded into the memory and initiated with the event that happened, right? So we have particular broadcast um, that can wake up something that is in the storage, brings it into the memory and into the runtime and kind of execute it, right? So if the new email comes or if the new SMS comes or whatever, like you may have some network activity uh, broadcasts or you may receive the broadcast for some JSON notification or something and then you want your app to kind of be woken up, right? Um, and those registrations happen in the manifest file. Um, but there is a concept of local broadcasts and they only happen within the runtime system. They are only for people or for the activities or services which are already in the runtime system. And those are like that. So you cannot register any of them in the manifest file because even if you do, the OS will not wake you up. Uh, you have to be loaded in into RAM, and then you can um, um, react to that. And that happens through code, and in your code you're saying, I am registering this particular broadcast receiver for that particular intent, and then I'm deregistering it, right? So it's like uh, bound into the execution. So if you have a life cycle, uh, you may at the beginning of the life cycle register it, and at the end kind of cancel it, or you can register it and cancel it kind of somewhere through the activity or a service. Um, so for this particular case, we cannot use really an activity because it would be occupying the user screen, right? It has to run in the background. So we would have to register them using those uh, local broadcast registration mechanism within a service or within some sort of a background set, right? Um, so we don't really need a UI for logging it we just need some service running in the background, right? So what, what does it mean? Uh, what permissions will we have to have to do that?
is listening to any of those uh, events that require us to ask user for information? I couldn't find anything. Yeah. So no, right? Uh, we don't need any permissions to do that. Uh, does it bother you? Well, because it's only allocating the JSON. That's right. It, it's just, yeah? Yeah, but you, for at least me, I assume that all the services on my phone are good intention. Like, they have a good intention. So like, for example, update uh, services, which is for new updates. Like, I don't mind if they know some status. Yeah. But if you get a service which you haven't installed or you don't know you have, yeah. and they are pulling with, uh, Permissions which you don't need permission to get. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of easy. But I generally don't think that that is my fault. Yeah. However, so I agree. However, um, we don't, so the answer here is no permissions needed. Um, the side effect, that, there are two side effects. One side effect is, well, for the research purposes, if the user stores the data locally, you know, the researchers can't really access it, right? So what can we do? How can we, let's say, you all want to participate in, in my study. I want to check if you're addicted to your phones and check them compulsively. Um, but I need this data. So I, you know, I ask you to install this app. You installed it. The, the app is logging your activities, your compulsive checking of the notifications. <coughs> uh, how can I get it from you? Yeah? Yeah, is there a way to stop it? Yeah, so uploading, right? Um, I can do that via USB cable. I can tell you, come to my office at some on Monday next week. I will upload all the data that you have. Or, so I don't, let's say, USB Bluetooth based. Or we could use a network, right? So I could install a daemon that uploads the data to Firestore or to some spreadsheet, Google spreadsheet, right? But for that one, I need permissions, right? So I will need you to grant the app permission for accessing network, right? And a lot of social apps and a lot of uh, apps that you use do require network connectivity, right? But they don't require permissions to do that. So how do you know that the apps that you granted the network rights don't do that? They don't track your behaviors. Well, you believe they have good intentions, right? Uh, like Facebook, for example. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, that's right. You kind of assume that they do this yeah. anyway, right? Uh, so you can't really discount this. So the security model, the, the way, the granularity of how much you can grant or not permission is, is better than nothing, but it's still very, um, it's, it can be easily abused, right? Uh, so you don't know what people are using the network for, right, when you grant them the network permission. Uh, you don't know if they do behavioral tracking of you or not. Um, and also, you as a developer, if you say, I will do this and I will send this over the network, uh, you cannot really prove it, right? Like to, to the user that that's the only thing that you're doing, right? Because they don't see what you're actually logging because you, they are not granting permissions for any of that. They only give the permission for, you know, internet connectivity, right? Uh, so you can tell them I'm doing this and I'm only sending this data and nothing else but you cannot like demonstratively prove to them unless you have an open source project of some sort or whatever, right? Um, so the mechanism for recording uh, system data uh, is built in. It's, it's easy, right? Using the broadcast receivers. Uh, the permission systems allow you to, um, to use it, but the contract between what you're doing it for and what the user uh, can expect it's just by sort of a policy file. So you have some sort of a privacy file which explains what you're doing, but it's not in the system, right? 
how hard would it be to, to turn it into kind of a system level uh, protection that it's kind of uh, detailed? So you would require almost every functionality like you be able to set it. Yeah, so it is technically possible. It would be a nightmare to use, right? Yeah? Yeah, but I don't think you will use it. Because I yeah. think they use this method themselves. They own or runs Android, so why should they uh, neglect their own uh, ability to do anal analysis? Analysis, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's true. There is some, some sort of uh, self interest uh, in, in it, um, which actually happened. And uh, like a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, this outbreak uh, that even if you disallow. Google to track your location everywhere, they continue to track your location, <laughs> right? Uh, that you cannot really turn it off. You, I mean, you, you do turn it off, but it actually happens that the data is still being passed to, to Google. Uh, it's anonymized, it's not, uh, usually it's anonymized anyway, uh, but you can't really tell the phone not to do that, like the phone is still doing it. Uh, and there is a lawsuit against Google for kind of violating some of the um, privacy protections in the US. It probably will happen in Europe as well. Um, because it, they, they seem not to be doing it anymore. That actually, when once you stop it, then it, it is stopped. But it was not like that a few weeks ago. Um, so, okay. Um, right, so second, um, Second question, uh, what's the difference between the normal phone and the rooted device? What are the main differences if you root your phone, what changes to the phone which is not rooted? You can change some system files. Yeah, you have access to system files, what else? can modify already existing apps. Yeah. And you use a license. So if the phone is rooted, you have access to system files. What else can you do? As I said, you can modify the other applications. Modify apps. You can send out broadcasts, like system uh, broadcasts. the detected system broadcasts. Yeah. Fake system broadcasts. So from, if, if you are an app developer uh, and you're developing, yeah, you're developing an app and you want certain properties, right, uh, for the app, uh, what installation of this app on a rooted device changes from installing it on the normal device? Extended uh, like price. Yeah. Are we assuming that the application is using the root, or can be exploited by root? Yeah. So we uh, like we have two cases. So in one case, uh, the app is not using the root. It's a normal app, right? So you have a normal app, uh, and you have a uh, rooted and non-rooted device. And of course, if you have an app that requires root access, you have to have root access, otherwise the app cannot do that, right? Uh, but for the app that is not requiring root access, what does it change for from the app point of view if your device is rooted or not? Input from the other system applications, system services, can be false. 
Yeah? Correct. So what, what happens to, let's say you have malware, you develop some malicious app, and you, this malicious app gets to a phone which is rooted, or to a phone that is not rooted. Which one is better for the app? Of course, the rooted one, right? With the rooted one, your app has access potentially to anything, right? Uh, if they can exploit the, the root credentials. Uh, on an unrooted device, there is no way the user can, by mistake, grant a root privilege to an app, right? So the app can do only limited damage because of the protection mechanisms built in into the operating system. So. Android is quite uh, interesting because um, they've used Linux uh, multi-user paradigm to provide security for the system, right? So normally on a PC, like on, on Windows, which is kind of a single user operating system, you only have one user which runs everything, right? Uh, and you have two modes. You have the privilege mode and the user mode. Uh, but you don't have multiple users using the system at the same time. Uh, you just have one user and potentially a root uh, privileged user, right? Uh, but you cannot have Bob and Tom using the system at the same time. But on Linux, on multi-user operating system, you can. You can have Bob and Tom using the operating system at the same time. And you have to have a mechanism to prevent Bob messing up with Tom's memory and Tom's messing up with Rob. Bob's memory, right, when they have two processes running at the same time. So they should not see each other memory and they should not see each other what they are doing because those are two different users. So there is a, a lot of protection built in for multi-user systems to isolate them so such that you can run multiple users at the same time with a given level of security. And Android use, is using it to isolate the apps. So each app runs as a different user. Uh, and they have different access to the disk, and they have a different access to the memory, and so on, right? Um, so if one app writes something to the disk in the app space, another app cannot read it, because it's only available for that app, as it, as it is on the multi-user system, where if I write something to a disk, somebody else cannot read it if I don't grant the permission, right? Um, so on the device which is not rooted, these protection mechanisms are in place and the apps can only do so much. And also the apps can write something which is local to the app. So if you're developing an app and you're storing particular secret, you, for example, in the app space, you're kind of guaranteed that that secret will not be visible to anybody. No other app can ever read that. System can, but the user doesn't have access to the system level privilege. So therefore, nobody will ever read that uh, secret. If you have a rooted device and you wrote something to a app space, which is a secret, like a password or, or, or something, then anybody else with root access can read that, right? Um, so you cannot uh, guarantee, certain security guarantees are out of the window, right? So you might have noticed if you were installing a, a banking app uh, that most banking apps will refuse to install themselves on rooted devices. They will check if the device is rooted or not, and if the device is rooted, they either warn you that you know your protection mechanisms are kind of out of the window, your app can be hacked, your app can be misleading you, your app can be used to store password, whatever, uh, or they just refuse to be installed and they say, yeah, you cannot use this app on a rooted device, you have to have an unrooted device, right? Um, so, um, what are the benefits of rooting a device? For you actually get a proper ad block. Yes. <laughs> Higher control for the access system. Yeah. You have a very fine control, but with the rights, with the privileges, come responsibilities. <laughs> you have to kind of now protect your phone more carefully against the malware or against apps some of the apps which can do kind of a lot of damage, right? Um, right, so let's do a little bit more. So uh, what I prepared is we have um, 
some group questions. You can split yourself into two groups, maybe. Um, and the first question is, um, what is available for a mobile application developer to secure users' private data on a mobile device? So we already mentioned one, um, which is that on Android, each app has the public store and private store. The public store is visible by other apps and by anything. The private store is only visible by the app itself. Nothing else can read from it and nothing else can write to it. Even user cannot read or write from, from it. Only the app can, right? So if the user wants to see what is written, he can't or she can't, right? So that's one, one mechanism. What else? What else is available uh, on a mobile device for the application developer to secure private user's data? Download our application. Say it again. Download our application or something like this. Yeah. When you send the parcel by SMS after try and do the SS or something like this. Yeah, so some encryption mechanism and some authentication mechanisms. Yeah, so you, you can join this four and you these three guys and uh, you can join these guys, and you can kind of check what else is available. Well, yeah, simple case, uh, you're developing a banking app and the user will have a PIN or something, a password, and you need to store it somewhere, right? Uh, how would you do that? That you maximize the user security. And we assume the user is naive and uh, can be easily tricked into uh, buying things. Uh, you cannot use this for local from Yeah? So you need some form of authentication for local. Yeah. So some mechanisms are local. Uh, some mechanisms you can use network for, right? Um, So the app which does local authentication works slightly different to the one which uses um, network-based authentication. So for example, when you log in to Google, you want to authenticate with Google, right? With your Google um, ID. How is Google making sure that, you know, Who you say you are, it's, it's correct. Well, they ask you for a password. Um, and then the password is hashed. The hash is sent over the network, potentially. Or you use some form of token um, to pass. So to do the factor of authentication. Yeah. And regional authentication. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So authentication is kind of one class of, of problems and challenges. Storage of the data is another, right? So let's let's split those two. So let's first talk about the storage. And for the last uh, 
the storage system. Yeah? How does it work? Yeah, so there are two types. Um, one is software based and then it can be easily compromised with a root access. The other one is hardware based and the hardware based cannot be directly compromised with root access but they can trick the subsystem into something. Um, so, yeah, we will talk We'll talk about the scenario in a moment. So let me just take a note. Um, Yeah, so the next question is, what's the difference between software-based and hardware-based security? So you can get access to software-based if you have a root right, and you don't if you have a, have a hardware-based security. Mm -hmm. So in other, in other words, what you're saying is that with software-based security, we can use software to crack it or go around it. With uh, hardware-based security, software is not enough. We cannot just use software to get access to something, right? Yeah. And you have the Android uh, like abstraction of the roots. Mm -hmm. You have like the uh, hardware and the front-end and the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a lot of more, a lot more distance from user space down to the hardware than it is from user space to user space. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, it's it's harder to actually reach the, the operations and the everything that the, the operation. Yeah. All of this. Yeah. So imagine that you have BIOS. You know what BIOS is? Mm -hmm. What's BIOS? It's a bridge between hardware and software. Yeah. So it's kind of like a thin layer of logic which sits between the actual hardware and the rest of the system, right? And it is responsible for booting up and presenting all the interfaces of, to the hardware, to the upper layers, right? You can have BIOS which is done uh, in, a, in a way that can be reflashed, right? So it's actually done, it's a software thing that you can refresh. Have you ever refreshed your BIOS, updated your BIOS in your computers? You can download the new image and you can flash it, right? So what happens if you flash it with uh, malware? You, you do it, right? <laughs> or what happens if the malware puts itself into your BIOS? You do not what if the BIOS is a hardware chip, which is manufactured, let's say, by Cisco or by whoever used that particular BIOS? And it cannot be reflashed. It's just silicon, right? Um, then ha what happens then? It is kind of not possible to hack it, right? It, it's there. It's like un unchangeable, right? You cannot fake it. You cannot change it. So hardware security is kind of... Uh, better in a sense, right? It's harder to circumvent. Uh, it's not easy to replace. But as we have now with all the uh, speculations about the manufacturers of the hardware chips, uh, it's really hard to say what is exactly on the chip, right? So with software, you can get the, take the software and you can analyze exactly what it does, right? Uh, with hardware, you can get the uh, specs. You can even get the, the drawings of what it is, right? Uh, 
but you will have to compare physically if your drawings are actually what it is uh, with the uh, physical implementation of that hardware. And it's really hard to demonstrate that the hardware is not doing anything apart from what it is spec, right? Uh, because you can say the hardware is only doing that, uh, and it will do that. You can test that it's doing that, but you cannot demonstratively prove that it's not also doing that, um, as, especially if you don't know what that extra thing is, right? So it's really hard to say that the hardware is secure. But if you have some sort of a certification, if like you have some sort of a process which guarantees you that the hardware is secure, it's usually higher level of security than software based, right? Um, so it has software based that's cheaper, it's more flexible, uh, more robust, you can kind of uh, use it in different uh, systems. Hardware base is more expensive, but it can provide higher level of security, right? Um, so, um, economically speaking, uh, it's, it's in the best interest of the companies producing the hardware not to compromise the uh, the perception, right? So if, let's say, uh, Intel is demonstratively putting some malware into the hardware, right? That would really ruin their reputation, right? Uh, to a point where, like, a competitor would take, would make a huge uh, market advantage, right? Uh, from the other hand, you have smaller manufac chip manufacturers which might have some kind of interest in putting additional features into the hardware, right? Uh, which may or may not be exploited. They may not be putting kind of malware per se, but they might be putting some undocumented features which might be exploited for some things, right? Or they might have a bug, right? So it might be kind of something that uh, they don't know about, but it actually happened to be a bug which can be exploitable, right? Uh, and those things are really hard really hard to discuss or really hard to demonstrate that something is one way or the other. There will always be speculations. Um, so it, it is kind of a very difficult topic to, to deal with. But if we kind of assume that the hardware is relatively simple, it can be produced in a kind of a monitored environment and then it ends up being kind of what it was designed to be, then it offers greater security than software base. Yeah, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, I thought you mean this about uh, kind of the monopoly mm -hmm. on hardware components. So say, for example, that Intel installs some kind of factory in their hardware, yeah. due to telecom compliance or something, yeah. and they got, get exposed. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? The chips are already like in two billions computers. So. That's true. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we have the Spectre. Um, uh, vulnerabilities and so on because of the way the speculative execution works you can kind of deduce some of the things you can leak some of the keys and things like this because of the uh, speculative execution that we have on the chips uh, and you know we kind of understand the vulnerabilities but it's a kind of a balance it's a trade-off the cost-benefit ratio right um, so it, it is difficult um, so coming back to our topic um, so we have, you mentioned secure storage. Right? <coughs> um, so secure storage is a hardware component, usually, which allows you to store something on that storage, which then is impossible to get out, right? Um, so you can have a hardware-based uh, storage system, which cannot be uh, ex externally read, right? But then, you know, it's useless, right? <laughs> if you store something which can never be read uh, and so on, then it's like, okay. And if it can be read, then it can be exploited, right? So there is kind of a catch here, right? So just a secure storage would be quite useless, right? So we need something extra. So, um, yeah, so we, something which is called TEE, uh, Trusted Execution Environment. Right, and this one usually works together with the secure storage, so it's only the trusted execution environment which can read and write from the uh, from the storage, right? 
So how does it work? Well, in very simple terms, what you can do it, what you can do is um, you have your normal app space. So this is your app and kind of the operating system level. Uh, here you have um, the trusted execution environment with a storage which nobody has access to, right? Um, and what you will do is you will say, I need to have, uh, I need, I have this pin. The user kind of has uh, in their head, uh, and I need to uh, hash it or I need to encrypt it, right? So I need some sort of a key for sorting, for hashing, or for the encryption, right? And this key, I don't know anybody to know what it is, right? So what I will say, I will tell my uh, uh, trusted execution environment processor to generate the key and then store it in the storage, right? So this key, the user doesn't know what it is, nobody knows what it is, and it's stored here where nobody can ever read it, right? So once we have the key here, it means nobody ever saw this key and nobody will ever see this key, right? Because it's here. And then when the app needs to authenticate the user, um, the, um, so first the app asks the user, okay, uh, give me the pin. So then the user gives the pin. The OS asks PE to kind of uh, encrypt the, the pin using that key and gets the value and then the app stores the value here, right? So we have the value uh, of what the app will use to authenticate the user, that that's the same user, right? And then the next time the user comes, the user puts the pin in, the app takes the pin and asks the PE to do the kind of the encryption and checks if the, uh, the pin matches the value, right? In fact, the value can also be stored here so the app doesn't need to know what the value is, and it just asks the key to check if the new pin matches the old stored value for the user, right? Uh, and then the check is done kind of in a secure fashion. The app doesn't know anything because the app never stores anything, and then the app gets an answer yes or no and logs the user in or not, right? Uh, and the app, even if the app is compromised, the app doesn't leak anything because there is nothing the app really stores or knows, right? Um, so the use of a trusted execution environment is very useful for storing secrets and for working with this uh, type of applications, yeah? Uh, would it be possible to like, go between the app and the trusted execution environment and just tell it how the app basically is that, yes, it's actually prepared, ready? So you kind of, yeah, that's right. So that's that's exactly what this is, right? So if you have a rooted device, you can do this type of attack. You can kind of uh, inject yourself in between and kind of uh, fake some of the things. So the app thinks that it interacts with the trusted um, component, but it's not, right? Uh, the the um, then you can kind of uh, fake whatever you need for the app. You, you cannot still steal this, this key though, right? So even if the device is rooted, the a rooted device cannot access the, the actual key. It cannot leak the, the, the hash or the key of some sort, right? Uh, so let's say you have your Bitcoin wallet and you store your private key in, in this trusted environment. Even if your phone is compromised, your private key will not leak, right? But if your phone is compromised, what can happen is, uh, especially if there is a network access, uh, the, the, this can be used to authenticate something that the user doesn't want, right? So if, for example, an attacker wants to send some Bitcoin somewhere else, they can say, prepare a transaction and use the trusted execution environment to sign it and then use it, right? Even though the key didn't leak, the attack can, can can be possible if there is uh, outside access or if the, it is built in into the malware, right? Um, but the, the point is that this is actually secure enough that it will never leak outside, which, which doesn't mean that your wallet cannot be compromised or if the private data cannot be misused, right, by the malicious software. Um, if your phone is not compromised, then it's not possible to inject something in between, 
because the pathway through the operating system and the security level for the app is done in such a way that it's not possible, right? So that's why bank, banking apps are using this mechanism to make sure that you know you don't have any malware which um, uh, well, it's to save the user, but also to save them, right? Mm. Uh, because if if the uh, what, what can happen is you have you have the obligation to secure your pins and so on, right? So you're trying to make the best effort not to leak anything. Um, and, but if your phone is compromised, and then your phone is misused, and your funds are transferred somewhere against your will, then it, it is kind of like a, kind of a criminal offense. And then it's not the user's fault, but it's not the bank's fault either, right? Um, but on the other hand, you have the situation in which case the user simulated that that's what happened, and they're using it for fraudulent uh, you know, purposes, right? They actually transfer them, they, they funds to themselves, and then they got the funds back because it wasn't, you know, a criminal kind of offense, but it was used for fraud, right? And then distinguishing when it is used for fraud and when it isn't is kind of hard if your device is rooted, right? Because you could have installed it yourself. Uh, but if the phone is not rooted, then it's kind of a clear case, like you cannot be compromised. So if you transfer the funds, it means you transfer the funds, or you leak the pin, right? Um, so most of the time, I mean, it, again, it's complex, right? Sometimes, uh, yeah, you had a stupid pin that was guessed or something, right? Um, so what else can um, can the trusted execution environment be used for? Have you used it before? Have you programmed it? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a nightmare because each manufacturer has have their own and they differ slightly in their capabilities. So depending on the API and depending on the hardware, you have certain functionalities and sometimes you have them in hardware, sometimes you're not. Uh, most of the time what you can do is you can store a value or a key value pair uh, in the store. Uh, you can hash, you can do some cryptographic operations like hashing, encryption, uh, decryption, um, key generation, um, and so on. Uh, what what is tricky is that um, this uh, storage is protected by the user unlocking the phone, right? So if the phone is locked, the storage is locked, and there is no way anybody can have access to it, even the trusted execution environment. Uh, if the phone is unlocked, then the storage unlocks. And it's bound to the um, to the unlocking of the device. And what happened in the early days, it was kind of um, tied in to either your PIN or to your fingerprint or to me mechanisms that were unlocking the phone, right? So if you re-register your fingerprint, it would be uh, it would invalidate the previous store. Right, so let's say you have some banking IDs and stuff on your phone, which are stored in the trusted uh, storage, in the secure storage, and you decided to change your fingerprint from this thumb to this thumb, and then all the data would be lost forever, so you cannot access it. And as we were discussing, you often use it in such a way that you generate the key directly in the storage, and then the key is never backed up or never anywhere else. Right, so if you do this finger, finger thing, then suddenly you lost access to all the data which was already there. You have to re-enroll with your bank and with everybody, right? It's kind of a big pain in the ass. Um, so because of usability, uh, modern execution environments, they allow you to extract and back up the private keys, right? Uh, which is, yeah, a bit of a, uh, again, like usability versus security balance, yeah? How is uh, the process done with backing? Yeah, you can basically read the private part. Yeah, because yeah. if it's um, for example, the process of backing up, if that can be classified not to you, well, since they offer the ability to back up. Yeah, but backup. that's right. So what, what happened was they allowed the ability to read 
before that ability was actually physically impossible. Now this ability is possible. You have to unlock the phone first, then you can back it up, right? And then you can restore it if you have the backup uh, previously done. Uh, so you can, of course, secure it via encryption. So you kind of getting the encrypted versions and then you putting through some kind of encryption mechanism. But just the notion that you can kind of physically get it out of the secure element is um, one of the attack vectors that can be misused. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, so we covered all the questions. Um, we have another scenario, uh, which, um, yeah, you can think about it um, later on. So let's have a yeah, 10 minutes break. And we can, because we covered most of the, most of the scenario already, so we can kind of briefly discuss it and then we will discuss the topics for the essays. So let's have a break first. <coughs>
Yeah, th this is a potential um, exam question which you may get uh, at the end and you have to kind of elaborate why you would you advise this or that, right? Uh, so you can kind of think of this. Um, we covered most of it through our discussion uh, and usually it is, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just how many different things you consider, right? So the, the better quality answer considers more, more things. The lesser quality answer considers just one aspect or two. If you kind of can, you know, elaborate on, on multiple perspectives and multiple things, that kind of strengthen, strengthens your, your answer, basically. Um, and then we have those uh, couple of uh, papers here. Uh, so that one is a good uh, short article about the problems with the key store and people, you know, unconscious or subconsciously or unknowingly messing up with the secrets that they were stored. Um, and yeah, there are some um, various um, aspects that uh, we discussed already, but you can uh, read a little bit more in depth. And then we have um, uh, two things. So I will add one more. So Shamir secret sharing and uh, zero knowledge proofs. So I want you to know what those are and how they work. You don't need to know all the math, but you need to know conceptually uh, how, you know, how does it work and for what purpose we use it. So who knows what uh, Shamir Secrets sharing is? Have you heard about it? Okay, so conceptually it is again quite simple. Um, let's say you have, um, you have, um, yeah, what can we use? Yeah, we can use Bitcoin wallet again. So you know uh, how Bitcoin works, right? It's a key, uh, public private key pair. Uh, and you have the, the blocks, and then you have a particular transaction, and then you have the unspent. Um, yeah, you have the unspent uh, output. So to spend this output, you need to have you have to prove that you have the private part to this address, which is kind of uh, funding the transaction, right? So if you have the private key, you can spend this unspent output to somebody else's public private key pair, right? Uh, so if we now have a user who has the private key, right? Uh, and, you know, you have uh, um, a single um, single user to manage that. You have a lot of pro uh, problems. So first of all, a user can lose it. Uh, second of all, a user can be compromised, right? Uh, you can be hacked or whatever. There, there can be a lot of different things that can go wrong with a single person being responsible for that secret, right? So in, in general, this is some sort of a secret that we have and one person is responsible for that secret, right? Um, so Shamir kind of came up with a mechanism where you could share the secret among multiple people, right? So let's say now we have um, a group of people. Let's say we have five of them, uh, or six. And we say uh, we would like kind of the secret to be shared among those people in such a way that not, neither of them individually knows what the secret is, but collectively they know what the secret is, right? So how could you do that? You can divide the secret on the several parts. Exactly. So let's say the secret is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Then we say, okay, this guy will know the first part, second part, third part, fourth part, fifth part, and sixth part, right? Um, this is a very naive way of doing it, but it would kind of work, right? And then they would have to get together and do that. The disadvantage is you need all of them to know what the secret is, right? And that is, again, not a desirable property. What about if we want to have a property which says, I don't want all of them for, uh, and let's say we have some vault, 
uh, and for unlocking the vault, um, for unlocking it, you need the secret, right? So I only want three out of six people, right? Or even, let's say, I want four, right? I want the majority, but I don't care who they are, right? Uh, so four out of six are needed to unlock the, the vault. How could I do that? Say again? Just taking a print for example, having every whole thing stored and then just checking it for hours. Uh, so you want all of them having the full secret? Or basically all six have one part that you only need for all of them. For the four parts. Yeah, that's right. So that's what Shamir's secret is basically. That's exactly what you said, right? So it allows you to split this thing into something that is, uh, which has six parts. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Each part is given to one of the participants, but in reality, this, this function which goes from here to here also allows you to go back. So there is a G function, which if taken four out of those six elements can restore what that is, right? So there is an element of redundancy uh, because you don't need all of them to restore the value. Uh, and there is an element of um, security because the thing is split in such a way that neither of them or neither three of them or neither uh, two of them can actually come up with what the secret is. You really need four of them, right? And this is, called, uh, this is customizable what that ratio is. You can say, I just want one of those six people, or I need all six people, right? So the way you distribute the, the, uh, the values, so there is some sort of uh, data field. So how you distribute this data into those parts is kind of customizable, like how, how you will do that. Uh, and we use, yeah, the math is not that, that hard, neither. It, it, it uses very similar mechanisms to uh, uh, RSA modulo arithmetic uh, to do this kind of distribution of the of the keys, right? Uh, so the idea is very simple: is you have some sort of a secret, you want to distribute it into multiple participants, and then to unlock or to decrypt something, you need part of them to give you whatever they share as well, and then you can do the reverse function, right? Uh, where can you use it? Well, you can use it in a lot of places. We discussed some of those cases last time where we're discussing the uh, secure computation mod models where you're distributing some kind of data among multiple participants to decrypt or encrypt something, right? Uh, okay, so then, then there is kind of a, a more detailed descriptions on the, yeah, on the wiki page. The second one is zero knowledge proofs. So what is that? We also discussed it before, but um, I want you to get a little bit of an intuition. And we will use two simple examples to explain it. So do, what, do you know what zero knowledge proofs are? Um, okay, so let me just quickly think. Right, so let's, um, let's have kind of a, a very simple uh, use case. Um, we have, um, <coughs> yes, you know the, um, this kind of uh, puzzle pieces, right? So you have those kind of puzzle pieces and you, you put it together a puzzle, right? So let's say there are two uh, identical puzzles, uh, A and B. Uh, and uh, Alice has one box and Bob has second, right? And they compete. They say, okay, let's go, and they go to two different rooms and they start putting the, the pieces together. Let's say there is a thousand, thousand pieces a puzzle, right? And now one of them is first, right? So one of them kind of has the puzzle solved 
and, but doesn't want to show exactly how it looks like to the other person because then it will leak some information to the other person and the other person might kind of uh, know how to fit, you know, put it together, right? So, but, you know, Alice kind of has it ready and she wants to prove to Bob that she has it ready, right? How can she prove to Bob that she solved already the puzzle without showing him the puzzle, without showing him how exactly it looks? You can show one puzzle and uh, tell where it is. For example, take any puzzle from the center, like a, take its coordinates, yeah. and show its puzzle with these coordinates, and she can compare. Yeah, so something along those lines. So what, what we will do is, we, we have this puzzle here, so let's say I have this thing here, and I have another piece, and I have another piece, and so on, right? And then when the puzzles are in the box, uh, what happens is they are kind of messed up. Uh, and for each puzzle piece, I just draw squares here, uh, we give them a number, right? So we take each individual puzzle piece and give them a, a single number, right? And we have two boxes, for one for Alice and one for Bob. And we ask Charlie uh, to do this numbering and it's consistent in those both boxes. So the same puzzle piece has the same number in both boxes, right? So then the complete solution is a sequence of numbers, right? If I have the solution, I have a sequence of, I don't know, 967 and then 1 and then 13 and so on. So if I read the rows, I will have all the pieces kind of in a cer certain order, right? Um, so now, uh, this box gets to Alice, this box gets to Bob, and what you're saying is you uh, show a particular piece, let's say piece 541, which is kind of here, and you tell what are the coordinates, right? But, you know, Bob doesn't have anything yet, and it, it has that 541 piece, and it's like, well, maybe, I mean, it doesn't prove to me that it's in the middle, right? Um, so, you have to use something slightly different. So this coordinate thing only works if you already have the solution. It doesn't work if you don't have the solution yet, right? Bob doesn't have a solution. It has, it, it, it didn't even start it yet. Alice was so quick, right? Uh, so he knows nothing, right? Uh, so he knows nothing which piece goes where, and he can just say what is, ah, no, what is in the picture. Yeah, but Bob doesn't know that. If you tell Bob what is in the picture, you will leak information. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like uh, mathematical ordering, you can uh, calculate some sum uniquely to that set of uh, or the solution, and then convey that number, and that number is public or not. To say, for example, the solution for for the number for this puzzle is 1001, and that's uniquely it. <coughs> you still doesn't like tell anything about yeah. solution-wise, but you have some um, calculation which you can back in. The Perfect. Exactly. So this is a perfect perfect case for a proof that would work if you already know what the final thing is, right? So if someone knows what the final thing is, you can calculate some mathematical function based on the order on which the puzzles are in, uh, and then you can uh, make this function so hard that it's really hard to guess, and then it kind of gives you a single number, like some number, and then if Bob, um, if, um, but that only verifies that the solution is correct, right? It doesn't prove to Bob that Alice solved the, the thing, right? If that number is publicly really known, know. yeah. So he can verify that the order Alice gives him is the correct solution. So for verifying, uh, it works for, for the, um, yeah, so it, for first time it works, but it leaks the data, right? It, like Alice has to give Bob the sequence, right? So that works fine, but only for the verifier if the total solution kind of can, can leak. But what if we don't want to leak anything to Bob? Then, we, then we cannot use that, right? We use some random functions, yeah, and maybe the modules. 
So yes, again, the math is not that hard, but uh, logically, what we want is we want a kind of a trick. So what we want is, for example, um, so we have those uh, piece, pieces, right? So let's say uh, this is a piece number 13, okay? So um, Alice says to Bob, yep, I solved it. And Bob says, no, I don't believe you. And, and she says, ask me anything, right? So Bob picks up a piece, which is um, piece number 13, right? From his set, he says, oh yeah, that's number 13. And, and he says to, to Alice, uh, show me that you have all the neighbors for piece number 13. And she takes a photo showing him that she has uh, filled in all the sides for the piece number 13, right, of the puzzle. She doesn't photograph what those pieces are because that would be information. She just photographs that she has them in the com completed puzzle that there are no empty spaces, right? That it actually fits, right? And if you know the puzzle is not that trivial, you have those uh, knobs everywhere, right? Uh, you know, it is possible, like especially if it's the corner piece, you only have two, three uh, little neighbors, and so on. That but sometimes if you have a, a, a flat side, right? Uh, you could say uh, any piece can fit on the flat side, right? But also, the pattern has to fit. So if there's some drawing, right, uh, the pattern has to fit, right? But Bob, just knowing the little thing, doesn't is not sure if that, uh, so only that information kind of leaks of what's on top of the, and from the piece, okay, I know that it has to be, if there is a line, there has to be kind of a line, and it has to be a knot, right? So I'm not leaking much more information to Bob, to what Bob already knows by having that piece number 13, right? So she says, oh yeah, look, I have a proof. Then he says, well, how about piece number 44? And she does the same. How about piece number 127? She does the same. And as they do this, he gets more and more certain that she has the whole puzzle solved, right? If she only solved 25%, uh, right? And he asks her about piece number 13. And it happens to be here. What are the chances? Well, you know, 25% chances that she had it, right? If she only saw a quarter, she had one in four chance that he asked the, the one from within the, the solution, right? Uh, slightly less because of the edge, right? Uh, then she says, oh yeah, it's like this. And then if he asks again, uh, it's like, you know, 0 0.25 times 0 0.25 chance that she will have the second one right. And then if he asks 10 questions, it's like 0 0.25 to the 10th, right? Uh, so you can see that her chances of, of her fooling him are going lower and lower, right? Um, so if we have a thousand pieces puzzle and we ask, you know, 128 times, uh, then the chances of her ever fooling him are close to zero for anything but the full solved puzzle, right? Uh, the, the, like, depending how much she solved. If she solved 95%, it's still going very quickly to zero, right? Yeah? But uh, wouldn't it be kind of, uh, kind of a threshold of how many times you can ask compared to, like you said before, you're conveying too much information? Well, the idea here is that each individual question doesn't convey any information, right? That's the, the uh, assumption that we're making. We're making an assumption that having a photograph of a little bit beyond this knob is not giving uh, Bob any information extra to what he already knows from the piece, right? Um, and there is a threshold because if, like, Bob wants to know from the probability of, you know, six nines that she cannot have it, uh, then there is only so many questions you need to ask if he needs to know blah blah blah, right? Depending on the, like if he wants to be sure 100%, he would have to ask her a thousand times, 
to all the pieces, right? Uh, but if he only knows some level of um, uh, sec you know, safety, only a certain number of questions, right? Um, so this is called interactive zero knowledge proof. So what it means is I can interactively ask you to do something and you give me an answer, uh, yes or no, uh, and then uh, the, the, you know, the, the question, uh, by repeating, I'm getting more and more uh, convinced that you're telling the truth, right? Uh, so, so for example, um, I, I am a blind person, right? And you have two pens. You have red and black pen. And I want to buy from you the black pen, right? And uh, the black pen is worth millions and the red pen is worthless, right? Um, so I will pay you those millions if you give me the black pen, but I'm blind. I don't know which pen you will, you will give me, right? Uh, so how can, I, how can you prove to me that the pen you're giving to me is the correct one? Well, again, we will use an interactive proof, right? So I will, uh, I will take those two pens from you, and I will uh, use them. Uh, so I will use the uh, red pen and black pen, and I will write on one piece of paper using this one pen, and on the second piece of paper using the black pen, right? Uh, and then I will uh, have the pens and the papers, right, together. And I'm blind. I, I only, like, I did this, and I know that pen, uh, red pen and black pen were used for the, for the markups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will uh, hide the, uh, the pens. Um, well, you gave me the pens and you told me this is the black pen, right? And then I will kind of do this, but you, did, you don't know what, like which pen I used on which paper, right? And I hide the pens now and I only show you one piece of paper. So I show you a piece of paper and uh, you have to tell me, uh, you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm showing you a piece of paper and I'm telling you black or, or, or red, and you have to tell me true or false, right? If this is a correct uh, mapping, right? Um, so if you want to fool me, like if you want to f sell me the red pen, uh, and I showed you the black paper, you will say red, right? So now it's fine, right? You, you kind of uh, fooled me once, right? But then I'm kind of mixing the papers again, and I'm showing you the, the papers again, right? Uh, and I'm asking you true or false. And then you can again, you have to again answer me, right? Uh, and then I'm kind of doing it at random multiple times. And if you, uh, and, and I, yeah, so I, I told the story wrong. So it's, <laughs> it's not that I am blind, you are blind, right? Um, so I know the colors of the, because you, you cannot know what is, um, um, yeah. Yeah, so you, like, if you want to fool me, you have to kind of uh, pretend to tell me something that is not correct. But you don't, you, you cannot consistently kind of lie to me because you can recognize the colors, right? So you can kind of just randomly try to cheat me, but by repeatedly doing that, your chances of, of actually getting it right are lower and lower, right? So the idea is that we kind of do that repeatedly, and the first interaction we have is 50% chance of you getting right or wrong. But then it kind of, the more we do that, it kind of goes down to zero, right? Um, so we kind of iteratively do this un until the point that I'm convinced that you kind of correctly telling me the truth, right? Uh, if you told me the wrong thing for the wrong thing, then you immediately get disqualified, right? Uh, so it, it's kind of an iterative way of proving something without um, leaking any information about what it is. And then you can change it to, to such a way that instead of Bob asking kind of a, oh, for number 13, oh, for number 241, oh, for number 248, and so on, 
you can just start with one number and have a function which generates all the rest of the sequence, right? So you can have kind of a, a function, let's say, a power or something. So it will take the number n, uh, do the power of d modulo 1,000, and it will kind of always end up with a kind of a piece puzzle. And then we kind of do that iteratively. Uh, but you know, there is no iterative answer anymore. It's just one question. You start with n, and there is just one answer, which is the um, the sequence of the um, of the photographs, which are for all those numbers that come here, right? And it's, it would be the same with the pen. So I have a particular sequence of pairs, and you tell me true, true or false, and then I give you this vector of the questions, and you give me the vector of the answers, and then we have all the sequence done in one inter interaction, right? So you can have iterative uh, or interactive uh, zero knowledge proofs, or you can have kind of just one answer, one question, right? Um, and then there is a prover. Uh, so Alice is the prover. She she proves that she knows something, and then the Bob is the verifier, which kind of verifies that she indeed knows what she's talking about, without Bob learning anything of what it is, right? Um, so those are kind of a two interesting concepts that we can use for making kind of a more complex and robust security systems using kind of a mobile or peer-to-peer -peer technology, right? Um, so I will add the, the interactive and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs link here as well. Um, and the final thing we have to do today, we're kind of running out of time, is um, yes, we have to fill in this table. Why it's so big? Because I made it big, I guess. Yeah, so um, we will um, yeah, write those essays. Uh, I haven't cracked the system yet, so I will uh, put, put the link on the wiki, uh, probably today or tomorrow. Uh, and you can browse the last year essays, but you have to put the titles of the of your essays that you will do. And I suggest we do um, yes, we have Tuesday, nineteenth. So how much time do you need? Two weeks for the first round. So what? So, for this course, we don't present it. No. You don't present it. You just write it, and then you read uh, other ones, and you kind of rate the other ones. So you do kind of a peer review, right? Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, maybe eight people doing the first round. And then if eight people are doing it, then we will have you will have to read two other essays and, and rate them. And then we kind of do the, the next round, right? So it's again iter interactive, iterative. Um, so let's do two weeks for writing and one week for reviewing, right? So you will have we will have like the next three weeks where you write and then review each other's uh, pieces, and then we have a session where we discuss it, right? But I need you to put the the titles and the topics, and the essays are short. Um, they are not as big as in the other course where you're doing the presentation and it's like, you know, 45 minutes of discussion. Um, here you have to kind of isolate a very small subtopic, simple aspect, and you make kind of a case for it, right? Uh, you may not agree with the case, or you may agree, and you may have good evidence, or you may not have good evidence, right? The idea is that you have good arguments and good evidence for what you're arguing. Right? Uh, and then if you're reviewing, you have to counter-argue. You have to say, uh, yeah, like if you're reviewing, you're saying how, what, the, what was the quality of the argument. If you're counter-arguing, you're arguing against. Right? Um, so I will remind you, I will kind of write down exactly the protocol, uh, and we can discuss it next week. But I need you to kind of uh, decide what, were, what are the topics that you want to cover for the first round. Um, and it can be. Uh, anything from any topic that we have on the list for the course. Okay.
essays should be based on one paper, on a particular paper? So yeah, so it depends. Most essays last year were based on one paper. Some were based on more than one paper. So it depends how, yeah, what exactly your argument was. Right? Sometimes you're arguing something that one paper is enough evidence for arguing that. Uh, sometimes you want to build your case and you want to include opinions of two or three paper authors, right? Uh, if your paper is kind of like a review paper, then yeah, one paper is all you need. Uh, and it, it also depends like how detailed your case was, right? Um, do you understand what, what is needed here? Essay is relatively short. Uh, it's a kind of an argument for something for agreeing with something or disagreeing with something or pointing something out and you use some evidence from the research paper to back yourself up right you don't really do your research yourself you're kind of basing your arguments on existing research uh, and you're only doing kind of a small part um, and the pur purpose is not to be right or wrong the purpose is to argue well right to build your reasoning or arguments correctly, right? Uh, that the conclusion kind of comes from the premise. Um, all right, so that's it. Questions? Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, put your put your names in. Oh, it's it's a wiki. Yeah, exactly. So edit this wiki yourself, put your names there, put the titles and link yourself to the topics which we have in the um, yeah, which we have in the course topics, right? So course topics have topics and the main topic plus something, right? Uh, and your actual title is what is within that field what is what was the question or what was the the point and I will give you the link to the uh, last year one so you get a bit of an idea um, yeah.